Let's bow now. Amen. Let's just go ahead and bow. Hallelujah. To his name. Thank you, ladies. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you. Thank you. Turn that there light off there, please, sir. Let me remind everybody about the baby shower for Carly. Sister Carly, we're going to have a party on June the 10th, Friday night, 630, there at Cafe Octane. And, and uh, last week, this insert was in there and, and uh, got some information on their needs. So join us, 630. Uh, that's a uh, couple of weeks from from now. Not this coming, not this week, but next. Amen. Y'all got children's church this morning? All right. We're not going to be long, but go ahead and take them. Take them out of here. No. <laughs> Let the boys and girls and y'all can go. Be with them for a few minutes, but we won't be too long. Amen. Well, y'all didn't call. I didn't know if you were going to use them or not. Uh Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you this morning, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to be a manifestation of the things of God. To be a manifestation of God in your life. What an opportunity. What a privilege we have. What a, 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 a privilege that we have to allow God. Think about it. We're talking about God. Manifesting himself through us. Man, that's, I don't know about to you, but that's mind-boggling to me. And I've kind of had a, what do you call it, an epiphany? Is that that word? Turn this light a little bit down a little bit more, please, so uh won't be quite so blinded. Amen. Amen. I've had a... I guess something that is so much on my heart about us being ministers of the gospel. And last Sunday night after preaching uh, that message and us being who we are in the workplace, not switching off on Monday morning, being a Monday morning atheist, not being a spiritual uh, schizophrenic, being one thing on Sunday and then way, just praising the Lord, having a good time, but... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we kind of get in this other mode. And then on Sunday, we think, that's a sacred day, let's go worship God. But I'm submitting to you, and I believe that until we understand this, until you understand that your ministry at your workplace is as significant as my ministry at my workplace, Thank you for that hearty amen. I believe it with all my heart. And so after having that just burning and went Sunday night to the revival at First Baptist Church in uh, Hughes Springs, and, and guess what he preached? The very same thing. Not something similar, the same text and the same message. And I quote, we will never win the world, what he said, or change our culture until this is understood and changed. I thought, yeah! Getting some of my own medicine right here. You are anointed and gifted of God. You are a minister. You have a ministry. Your life is spiritual. Your life, if you see a segment, if you compartmentalize your life and segment your life, Thinking, well, this is spiritual, I, I prayer, my Bible study, and, and that's the spiritual part. You're being a husband, you're being a wife, you're being a father, you're being a mother, you're being a housewife. Wherever you are, whatever you do, you are serving God, your master, as we read in Colossians chapter 3. Your career is your calling, and it's a high calling. It's a sacred calling. It's not something second class. It's not something less than any other minister of the gospel. Do you see yourself as a minister? If you're not, you'll never. We, and, and this uh, Bill, I'm not sure his last name, Utley, he's a professor at ETBU. Huh? Bob Utley. 
And he said, preachers are never going to do the work. In fact, as he read again in Ephesians chapter 4, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to prepare God's people for the work of the ministry. To prepare God's people for the work of the ministry. And I submit to you, your ministry, yeah, we need things here at the church. That's what we need. It takes volunteers. It takes effort to have a service on Sunday morning, to teach Sunday school, to teach the children. And we are in dire need of children's teachers. We're in dire need of children's teachers. We're in dire need of somebody to, to help with children's church. And there's other things. There's lots of opportunities to serve in this church. And that is important. And that is needed. But I submit to you, your greatest influence, you spend 70, 60 to 70% of your time at job, on your, on your job. And that's your sphere of influence. And when you multiply, the average person has about 20 people that they influence at work. And you multiply that times the people here, times 20. Look at the impact that we can have on our culture the, at the place where we work. And then in our home. But you've got to see yourself as an anointed, gifted minister of God. Everywhere you go. And the fact, if we don't do that, then God will start changing. Our marriage won't be what it's supposed to be. If you don't see it as sacred. The problem with marriages, they don't see them as sacred. God instituted marriage. God is the uh, marriage is God ordained institution. And it's spiritual. You shall become one. It's, sex is spiritual. It is. And, and things that are not viewed in the light that they are in will be abused. And that's why marriage and that's why sex and, and all that is abused. It's a God thing. It's a beautiful thing. But the devil, because it's not seen for what it really is as a sacred then it's abused. It's demeaned. And marriage itself becomes as a way just to satisfy and, and somebody to meet your needs. And it won't work. It's spiritual. Your job is spiritual. See yourself. And nothing is significant, insignificant. Nothing you do is insignificant. But you do it in the name of the Lord. Amen. Did you know that 52 parables that Jesus taught in the Bible, how many of them had to do with the workplace context? 52 parables, how many of them had to do with work in the workplace context? 43 of the 52. Jesus appeared 132 times. His appearances in the New Testament. Of 132 times, 122 of them were in a workplace type environment. Forty miracles in the book of Acts. Thirty nine of them took place in the context of a work area, a workplace. Maybe it was the uh, uh, market, something like that. Mm. Jesus went about doing good. He went about. He went where the people were. We've got to stop separating our work from our worship. We've got to stop separating our career from our calling. And a lot of Christian leaders over the years, and especially in the last uh, 10, I'd kind of forgotten about it, but re thinking about this and, and reading and preparing, have, have gone back and, and, and read and heard sermons, many of them Christian leaders, Billy Graham being one a few years ago, that, that said the next great arri uh, arrival, yes, revival... Is going to take place in the workplace. The next great awakening. Great arrival in this country is going to take place in the workplace. I didn't print it off, but I've got uh, several cases that I wasn't aware of. Uh, one in the, the mid-1800s. This guy employed, it was on Wall Street. Just a block from Wall Street. And his church commissioned him as a... As a minister, workplace minister. 
And he went and hung some posters up. And he, he said, I'm having a prayer meeting at noon. He didn't hang them up in the church. He hung them up in the businesses on Wall Street in that area. It wasn't too many days later, he had hundreds of people in prayer meetings. And within a year, one, I believe it was 100,000 people, 100,000 people got saved. Simply because he saw himself for who he really was. Not just an employee, employee, but a minister. I'm telling you, you are a minister, not just an employee. For 30 years, Jesus worked. Or at least when he got big enough. We know he started at 12, don't we? <laughs> minister. But he started carpenter work at some point in his life. And for 30 years, he served God. He served his father as a carpenter. Don't know a lot about that time of his life. But one thing we do know, when he came to John the Baptist to be baptized, baptized, yeah, bab- baptized. And, and his father said, Behold, He's my son in whom I am well pleased. What did Jesus do that was so pleasing to his father? That's a Saul, by the way. Cutting, making things. Serving his people, drawing plans, cutting out, nailing, sawing. Wasn't he a carpenter? Sir? Right? Yes. Yes. Where's that pride? Go? And then he started his ministry. We think his ministry just started his ministry at age 30. Boy, he'd already ministered. And the things that Jesus did up to his time of, I mean, everything. Well, he started his ministry at age 30. See, there's the fallacy. Because you think. Your ministering may be when you're at the church. It may be when you're doing this. But I tell you, when you show up on your job Monday morning, when, let's back up. If you're married, you're a minister. When you go to the job, show up there, you're, you're in the ministry. But you think about that. That Jesus, pleasing his Father, he was just as much in the will of God, sawing, and hammering and building as he was hanging on the cross. We've got to change our mentality. And I guarantee this, I believe, what's crippling the church, what is hindering our impact, keeping us from having the influence and the impact in the culture that we're so capable of having. is the mentality that my workplace is not my place of ministry. We think of the gifts of the Spirit. We think of them in the context of the church, and they are to build the church. But how many know, how is the church built? One thing by winning converts. Salvation. You just come to seek and to save. And he sent us into the to go and preach the gospel. And so why can't we see the gifts of the Spirit 
or use at our job as, this, as we would see them at use in the church. Gift of health, gift of service, gift of ministry, gift of miracles, gift of faith, gift of healing. Why, why can't we operate in that? If we get out of this mindset, why can't we operate and function in those gifts on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? How about TGIM? Thank God it's Monday. Hallelujah. Will you see the fallacy? It's TGIF, isn't it? We've got to change our mentality. I, I, I firmly believe what, what that professor said, Bill, who? Bob Hutley, 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 U-T-L-E-Y, I believe that's what he said. You'll never win the world. He said, pastors can't, he said, we're not even putting out just the number wise that are, quote, full-time pastors that are graduating from seminaries, going to, he said, even statistically, numbers well, we don't have enough for the churches. He says it will never happen unless and until this is understood for every member of ministry at your workplace, doing the will of God, operating in your, functioning in your gifting. And Jesus was as much in the will of God the first 30 years as he was the last. 30 years. Three years. First Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read there before we leave this morning. I'll start my message. One last minute. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. As you're turning to First Corinthians 12. Think about this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I'm going to research this some more. But in the garden, he, he gave them the job. He said, you, you work and you tend to the garden. And that same word, work, is translated other places, that Hebrew word, worship. And we have this mentality that work is, is, is just the curse. It's just the curse, and we just work because it's the curse, and it's this burden that we have to have. Everybody say, that ain't right. That ain't right. It's the opportunity you have to provide. Work is not the curse. Work is an opportunity to serve God and, and, and manifest the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. First Corinthians chapter twelve. <clears throat> to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It goes in and lists at least in this place those nine gifts of the Spirit. The manifestation of the common good. Manifestation there, it means exhibition, expression, demonstration. First Corinthians chapter 2, turn back there in First Corinthians. Turn back to chapter 2. Read with me in verse 4 and, and I think verse 5. Exhibition. Manifestation. Paul prayed, verse 3, look in First Corinthians chapter 2. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And listen why, listen why. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The reason God wants His power displayed, and I believe the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is part of that too. But the gifts of the Spirit on display through your life. For the, the, each, the manifestation is, of the Spirit is given to every man. Why? So that people can see the power of God. So that people can see the power of God. I believe, what, what about the fruits? The character of God is developed in us. And that, too, I believe, plays a role. 
And people see love and joy and peace and patience. They see the character of God. But they also need to see the power of God. The miraculous power of God. Paul prayed. Again in Acts chapter 4, I believe in verse 29. They prayed. In, in, in light of all the threatenings that they were getting. Not to speak anymore in Jesus' name. That stretch forth your hand. Enable us to speak the word of God with boldness. Stretch forth your hand, they prayed, so that healings and signs and wonders would be done in the name of your holy son, Jesus. I believe we need to be stretching out our hands where we work. I mean, you got to be wisdom. Amen? I mean, you can't, you got to use wisdom and diplomacy and and, and you got to do it right. But there's no reason you can't pray for the sick on your job. There's no reason you can't have a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. There's no reason a miracle can't happen at your workplace. The great arrival, many of them, and I'm going to share some with you next week. That's why they happen. People got bold on their job. And they pray for people. People got saved. There were miracles that happened. I believe that's God's will. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. And that word, it, it, it means exhibition. God wants to express himself through you. And one, reason, one way he does that, one is through the gifts. I think they work hand in hand. He can express himself through the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of his Spirit in, in the fruit, the character of your life, being made and conformed into his image and in his likeness. But God also used his power. Miraculous power of God. People are hungry for the miraculous. And I think the church, we need to step up to the point. And pray that Acts 4, 29, for Lord, help us. In the midst today, not unlike that day, they were told, don't preach anymore in this name. They let him go and said, yeah, y'all can go teach. But don't do it anymore in that name. Uh-huh. Not any different than today, is it? Oh, you can get religious, you talk about God, but you mention Jesus and you see what happens. As far as our culture is concerned and our government is concerned. But I think we need to rise up as an army of God. Amen? And, and not in meanness and not in being ugly, but let's, let's put God, let's let God express himself in his miraculous power through us. You want to see some minds change? Mm-hmm. Come on. Let, let's, let's allow God, give him the opportunity to manifest himself, to express himself. I believe this manifestation of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, is, is given to us so that we can express who God is. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. And that manifestation allows us the opportunity to express God, who He is, His power. Talks thing about Pentecost. You know, God could have done that and poured out His Spirit without anything visible, but it's interesting to, to know things that happened that were visible. In fact, when Peter began to explain, hey, what had happened, he said, these things that you see... See, these things that you see and hear, mm. is God, I mean, is, is people seeing or he, hearing anything as a result of God in your life? These things, I won't take the time to mention all of them, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Acts 2, uh, verses 6 and 8. Verses 14 and 16, and verse 33. As Paul was beginning to, Peter, explain the happening, give explanation for what occurred, he used that word, seen, every time. 
These things that you have seen. What you've seen. What you've seen. It's like the wind. The Spirit is like the wind. You don't see the wind, do you? But you see the effects. You don't see the Spirit. The word Spirit is pneuma, as in pneumatic, as in air, wind. But the people, because of the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, people can see the effects of that. If we change our mentality and see us as ministers of the gospel, endowed and gifted with his anointing and with his gift and with the, I say, obligation to allow the Lord to express himself in those around us. Paul said, I'm not, I didn't, my preaching wasn't with enticing words of man's wisdom, not, not persuasive words, and, and, and that's okay, and I, I'm not a real good storyteller. I know some pastors, I really, I like to listen to them, but I got some good stories. I'm not faulting them either. Preach much better than I do, but you know all we need is the demonstration of his power. You don't really need a cute story. It's kind of fun and entertaining, and preachers do that. I do it to, to get attention, to make a point. Paul didn't do it. You can think, well, how can I word this? How can I do this that's real plausible on one context or, or persuasive or enticing? And How can I make this very palatable and enticing? How can I say this in such a way? That's man's wisdom. I submit to you, we need the power, the demonstration of his power and spirit. I really think, and when we think of that, we kind of tend to think about church. I mean, the walls and worship time and Sunday. I want us to broaden that thinking, change our mentality, and think, wow, I'm anointed. Your anointing is the same as my anointing. I believe we can have more or less anointing. In fact, I believe there's a double anointing. We look at the Word of God. It's very clear that there were different amounts of anointing on different people. It's the same anointing. And it's all predicated on what you're willing to receive. God's no respect of persons. What I'm saying is the anointing that you have received is from God, just like the anointing I receive and any other person has. And we have a kind of a tendency because of the organization and all the the, the, the pastor and, and maybe the clergy uh, versus the I'm just the laity. Yeah, I'm not full time. I'm not in the ministry. And all those words for the last, basically since 400 B.C. has really damaged the influence, hindered the influence of the because the truth is, you have an anointing. You have an unction from the Holy One. You're anointed and you're gifted, and God wants to manifest Himself in you, the fruit of the Spirit, and through you, using the gifts of the Spirit. Are you available? Thank God it's not.